So let's make some HTML and some JavaScript. Um, it's on CodePen, you don't have to put the head and the body and all that stuff. You just start typing the body in here. So let's just make something on the dang page. How about an H1? I less than three JavaScript. Yay, and there it is, just like that. How about that? Uh, what's this whole thing called? This whole business between all the angle brackets. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it is a heading. Um, but what, what in general is that called? Let's make a button here. Oops. Yeah. Oops. Ah. What are both, both the H1 and the button? What are those examples of in the world of HTML? Yeah. They're tags. Collectively, the whole thing is an element. There are two tags for each of these elements. There's an opening tag and a closing tag. And in between the two tags, we have contents. All together, we have an element. So an element with an opening, to opening tag and a closing tag, and potentially some contents in between the two tags. Uh, what if I say, Stuff like this. What are those called? Attributes, that's right. Attribute ID, attribute class. Each attribute has a value, big heading and thing. That's right. Attributes and their values. Cool. Anatomy of an HTML element. That's your anatomy lesson. So this is pretty dull. If we want to add some behavior to this, we can do so with JavaScript. We can just start writing code and make a bunch of stuff happen when the page first loads. That's not nearly as interesting as making something happens when we take some other action. So an awful lot of what we're going to be doing is event driven. Like this. When one thing happens, do a different thing. So we have to tell it when what happens and we have to say when that thing happens, do what. So that's an awful lot of what we're going to be doing with JavaScript, especially this first week. This first week, we're going to be doing just vanilla JavaScript right in the browser. Uh, no build system, no React, nothing like that. Just JavaScript, HTML, CSS, good old-fashioned way so that we actually learn the language before we start learning a library. So how can we make something happen? We could just make something happen when the page first loads. But that's not interesting. What's interesting is telling it to happen when something else happens. So how about when we click the button? <coughs> to bake an apple pie from scratch, first you must create the universe. To do something with that Burton button, or Tim Burton, I don't know, uh, first you have to get that button off the page. So how can we grab that button from the page in JavaScript? Anybody know? Anybody know how to grab that button from the page? Anybody done any JavaScript before? Anybody done JavaScript without jQuery? Cool. Well, you're about to learn. So if we want to deal with stuff that's on the page, we are dealing with the DOM. DOM, document object model. To deal with the DOM, we type document. And document is an object that's built right into JavaScript. Is that big enough for everybody? Don't be afraid to tell me no. A little, little bigger. That good? Cool. All right. So the document has a bunch of methods built in, that is functions, such as query selector. Query selector is our friend. Query selector lets us grab things off the page by using selector syntax. Anybody know CSS at all? A little bit? Well, in CSS, you'll have a selector and then some curly braces and then some rules. So the selector portion tells you which things from the page this rule should apply to. We use that very same syntax with document.querySelector to tell it which elements from the page we want to grab. There are two variations of this, query selector and query selector all. Query selector all will find all elements on the page that match the selector 
that we provide. Query selector will just find the first one. So if we want to find that button, the simplest selector we can use, and it will be a string, is the element name, like button. Simplest possible selector, just the name of the element. So strings in JavaScript, uh, single quotes, double quotes, makes no difference. The only difference in the world is which of those characters you have to escape inside the quotes. So if we say don't inside a string, well, it's going to think that first single quote is the end of the string, right? So you have to escape that with a backslash. If we use double quotes, same deal. As soon as it sees a second quote, it's going to think end of the string. So we have to escape the double quotes. Otherwise, there's no difference. So just be consistent. It is more conventional to use single quotes in JavaScript. So that's what we're going to be using. So query selector button will find that. Good enough for me. So we better save that to a variable. So let's create a variable. How do we create a variable in JavaScript? Aha, uh -huh, I hear a couple of options, var or let. Indeed, so var is the old way. We are using ES6, though, so we don't have to resort to var. We can use the newer ways. In a couple of days, we will talk about what's different and why the new way is better. The new way is to use let or const. The difference is not what you might think. Const doesn't really exactly create constants. They're still sort of variables, but you can't reassign them. You can change them, but you can't completely reassign them with another equal sign. Most of the time, we don't need to do that anyway. So we're going to use const unless we know we have to use let. And we probably won't have to do it for days. We can probably get by using nothing but const for a very long time. So we're going to use const unless we know otherwise. If we were making a for loop and we had to set i in there, we'd have to use let because i is going to be reassigned every time to through the loop. But if we're reaching for a for loop in JavaScript, eh, there's probably a better way anyway. So const, let's just call it button. Why not? No need to be clever. Const button equals document dot query selector button. Grabs the button right from the DOM. All right, now we want to make that button do something. Anybody know how to do that? Anybody know how to tell it? All right, button. When you're clicked, do something else. Two things we need to tell it. When what happens and do what? Yes, sir. Uh, very, very close. Event listener. Uh, that may have come from action script or something. I'm not sure. Um, or you may have just gotten the name slightly mixed up. But we can add what's called an event listener. Slightly simpler way at first that you could do it is also um, every DOM element has certain properties. And DOM elements are what we're making when we write HTML. Everything in the page uh, has a kind of tree hierarchy, starting with the root element, the HTML element. And each leaf on that thing is called a node. And those nodes can be one of two things, elements or text. So right now, we've got four nodes, really. The h1 element, the text that's in between, which is a text node, the button element, and the text that's in between, which is a text node. So that's what's on the page right now. And every element has a bunch of properties on it that you can set. Among other things, it has a bunch of properties that begin with on for various events. So for example, button has an, uh, a property called on click. Now JavaScript is generally case sensitive. Most of the time, things are camel cased. <sighs> Except for some of the stuff that was created in those first 10 days that Brendan Ike wrote the language because he wasn't totally consistent uh, writing an entire language in 10 days, believe it or not. So things like on click, it's actually all lowercase. And then you can just assign that some action to take. You can assign it a function. Functions in JavaScript are first class citizens and can be treated like any other piece of data. They can be assigned to variables, they can be passed as arguments to other functions, all kinds of good stuff. 
which actually is super, super handy. So what we can do is we can actually assign the onClick property a function. So we could write the function right here. We can have anonymous functions too that we don't give names, or we could write it and give it a name. Let's do that. Function, say yeah. We will camel case things because we're going to be consistent. So that's the function syntax. One of several ways that you can define a function in uh, JavaScript. This is a plain old function declaration. So now we have a function called say yeah. And we'll make it say yeah. Alert opens up a text box, super annoying. But it's the quickest way for us to get some output on the page for the moment while we're first learning. So what we could do is we could actually assign the onClick property of button to the function say yeah. Now notice I am not putting open close parentheses here. What would that do? That would assign onClick the return value of say yeah, which is a whole lot of nothing we didn't return diddly squat. So that's not what we want. We want the function itself. So remember say yeah is basically just another variable. The value of that variable just happens to be a function. So we are actually assigning that function to onClick we have effectively told it, when something happens, click, do something else. Run the function, say yeah. Unless I'm a big fat liar, none of this works. Let's see. Ready? Does it work? Yeah. How exciting. Now, I said there are several ways to declare functions. This is one of them, a good old function declaration. And check this out. If we move this down below, Does it still work? Yeah. So this is something called hoisting. When you use a function declaration like this, an interesting thing happens. You can use it higher up in the code than you actually defined it, as long as you're in the same variable scope. That's just how it works, and sometimes that's really handy. But we said functions can be anonymous with no name, and when that happens, um, you could just assign it directly, or heck, you could actually write this like a variable, like this. Const say yeah equals function. Totally works. Except that we lose hoisting. So in that case, you would actually have to move it above where you use it. Much of the time, we will actually be writing functions this way um, because there are some there are some instances where it's flat out better, and um, making functions behave like variables and so on can just get us some slightly more um, consistent behavior sometimes. And using const will keep us from ever accidentally reassigning it, because you could totally still reassign it the other way. But now if we try that crap, it won't work. So does this truly work? Assigning it like a variable. Yeah. Sure does. Cool. So, our friend Daniel said something about add event listener. That sounds interesting. One problem with on click here is that I could then say button dot on click equals something else and say yeah would go away and would no longer happen. If we add an event listener, we can add lots of event listeners. Uh, a lot of event listeners to the same event on the same element. So add event listener is kind of preferable. Luckily for us, every element in the DOM has a method built in called add event listener. And this is generally how we will be doing this. So add event listener is actually a function that takes some arguments. What are the two arguments? What would you guess? what event we're listening for, and what should happen when that event occurs. All we're doing here is saying, if this, then that. When this happens, do this other thing. So argument number one, when what happens? Click, just the name of an event as a string. Second argument, what do we do? We say yeah. Remember, not say yeah, open close parentheses, that would actually run it right here in place and uh, return undefined, and we would actually be, it would be the same as writing undefined in here. 
which does us no good whatsoever. We don't want to actually run the function. JavaScript is going to run the function for us. We're just telling it about it. We're just saying, do this when that other thing happens. And when that other thing happens, JavaScript itself is responsible for actually doing it. Does this still work? So that's exciting. We just added an event listener, and it did a thing when something else happened. Alert, however, is super annoying. Pop-ups are bad. So let's do something a little more interesting. Ooh, what if we changed the heading? Oh, oh shucks. What do you think? Can we do it? Yeah, we can do it. Heck, yeah, we can. Uh, how about we change the name of this function then? Let's call it change heading. Change it both places. And what's it going to do? It's going to change the contents of the H1. To bake an apple pie from scratch, you must first create the universe. So what is the first thing I should write inside that function? Who said that? Troy. Yeah. We got to actually have that H1 before we can do stuff to it, right? So let's say document.querySelector. And what string do you think I'm going to pass in there? H1. That'll do it. So let's save that to a variable. Const heading equals document.querySelector H1. And then we want to change it. So specifically, we want to change its contents. Anybody happen to already know how to do this? I know JavaScript is new to, to virtually everyone here, so probably not. Oh, what a lousy rubber band. My gosh, I barely pulled that thing at all. That's sad. Craftsmanship, there's just no pride rubber bands anymore. So there's several ways we can change the contents of an element. Uh, in this case, it is all just text, so it's really easy. Heading dot text content. Camel cased this time, capital C. Case does matter. So we could do that to get the content. Let's prove that. I hard JavaScript. And we can use that same property to actually change the content too. What do you say? What do you say, Charlene? Uh, yeah. What's that? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. All right. We changed the heading just like that. That was so easy. That's so easy, it's almost not even fair. What if we had some paragraphs on the page? What's going on here? All right. We have a paragraph. We have another paragraph. Boy, it's doing some weird stuff with indentation today. Weird, weird stuff. So by the way, line breaks here, they don't matter. Indentation doesn't matter. White space, uh, generally in HTML, is either ignored or collapsed down to one space. Yeah. What now? Uh, sure. So integers are just raw numbers. You just write them, write them like numbers. <laughs> oh, no. Um, what it'll do if you put a numeral over here, it'll just convert it to a string. So really, in HTML, there are only elements in text content. There's, there are no real number. There's no number data in there. 
it's going to be converted to a string automatically. So you may as well make it a string. Um, but yeah, you can do this, and it will just automatically convert it. <coughs> so we have a couple of paragraphs. And we want to change the second one, not the first one. We know query selector is going to grab the first one. So what can we do? We could give it, yeah. Sure, we could put an ID on it or something. I'm delighted that you're here. ID equals delight. Sure. Then what? Let's say change paragraph. How do we grab that paragraph off the page? If we just say P, it's going to grab the first one. Anybody know? We can use that class, or ID. It was an ID. What's that? Del delight, but if we just put delight, that's going to look for a tag named delight. Instead, we need to find one with an ID of delight. And there's a special symbol for that. And it's one that kids today just love. Hashtag delight, baby. Woo! That's right. Hashtag blessed. All right. So that will indeed say, find me any element with an ID of delight. And there should only be one of those on a page. It is illegal to put and use the same ID more than once on the same page. Now, browsers are very forgiving, and it'll render your page anyway. But things may not work the way you want because IDs are supposed to be unique. Does it work? Can I save it? Oh, well, right. It did change it. I was waiting for an alert. Yeah, totally worked. So again, these are called selectors. Selector syntax. They're also what you use in CSS to identify which elements you want to style. <coughs> so besides IDs, we also have classes. So a class, you might use if you have more than one thing on the page that you want to classify the same way. So IDs are for identifying elements. S classes are for classifying elements. So maybe you have um, a bunch of list items on the page, and certain ones represent your favorite books. You might have class equals books on those. So in this case, you can bet we're going to put uh, delight in here again. But again, that's going to look for a tag named delight. What do we do if we're looking for a class named delight? Not a hash, but a dot. So dot means class, hash means ID. So this says, find me any element. I don't care what kind of element it is with a class of delight. If we want to make sure it's a paragraph, we can put p.delight. No space between the two, just p.delight. And that selector is saying a paragraph with a class of delight. So little bit of selector syntax. Still work? Heck yeah, it does. Go us. Questions about this? We've had an event listener. We made it do things. When one thing happens, do something else. Whoops. Oh, yeah. In HTML uh, attributes, it is more conventional to give your attribute names, um, your attribute values, double quotes. Yeah. I, once again, it doesn't actually matter. But for some reason, it bothers me a lot to see single quotes inside HTML just because it's, it's less conventional. I tend to do things the more conventional way um, because it's nice to be consistent. And we want our stuff to look like other people's stuff. Makes it a little easier to read. So yeah, I find uh, single quotes jarring in HTML. But it does not actually make any difference. Good question, though. Anything else? Be happy with this? You ready to do a thing? Let's do a thing. <laughs>